exercise, I guess, teaching this material. So that will be, uh, it's also an experiment for me. Um, so I'm, so uh, this is my name. It has a bunch of accents on it. You don't have to pronounce them if you don't feel comfortable. Uh, this CNRS is my uh, parent institution. It's a national lab in France. It's like, it means Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, National Center for Scientific Research. And IBPC is the like local institute I work in in Paris, and that means Institut de Biologie Physico Chimique, which is like Institute for Physical Chemical Biology. So it's a nice mix overall. Um, and so the topic this morning is you know sampling for energy surfaces of collective variables. Um, I'm trying to I, I'll you know, cover this a little bit, but really the emphasis will be on the topic of collective variables themselves, because you know some of the uh, of the talks by Chris Shippo also cover the same material from a different perspective. I will say, so I, I think it, I, I hope it will be useful to have these two different perspectives uh, on some some common ground. All right. So the first request I have for you is. You know, please interrupt. Let's make this uh, lively and interactive, and, and don't let me go on with the next slide if you if you don't know what, what I'm talking about. So I like to in these talks because we're really at the crossroads between many disciplines. I like to uh, locate the field we're talking about uh, within other fields, right? So we do biomolecular simulations, and that in a biomolecular simulation, you, know, you need model systems that come from structures. Biological structures, but most typically anyway. You need interaction models, the force field, and you need algorithms to simulate the whole thing. So those come from structural biology and bioinformatics, possibly, and then physical chemistry, theoretical chemistry, plain physics, math, computer science. So what's really great about this field is that you get to talk to all of these people if you want to, ideally. And then of course, out of these simulations, we get you know more structures, possibly structural refinement, dynamics. Information on molecular interactions, thermodynamics, which is closer to the uh, topic today, and these in turn contribute back to structural biology, maybe by you know refining the structure. So you could have a loop here. Uh, there very much is a loop these days between structural biology and simulations, and then you know the information we get on thermodynamics gives us gives us insight into basic biophysical problems, and of course we can do pharmacology uh, based on our a view of molecular interactions. So when we simulate biological systems, uh, mostly, like most people who use NAMD do you know, all atom simulations. Of course, these systems are large at the atom scale. And there is, it's really hard to glean information from this. Uh, essentially, this is a lot of data and not much information. So, and then you have the curse of dimensionality. So any mathematical analysis you do in that high dimension space is extremely costly or you know un undoable. So what we often do, and we've started uh, uh, talking about this in the previous two days, is to look at reduced representations, uh, selecting interesting coordinates, and that's useful for really two things: you know, human intuition, because we can think in low dimension, but we cannot really think in dimension you know a uh, hundred thousand. And then for important sampling, and I will talk about it a bit more, but just kind of for enhanced sampling, generally speaking. So the, the outline of my of this talk in the morning will be so I'll I'll start with the basics, and I hope uh, I hope you don't get bored. I'll, I'll be a little quick. I, I think you know the uh, you know the, the, the basics, but you know if I get the more feedback I get from you, the more I can adjust the base and like skip over things you already know. Or maybe expand on things that, where I'm too fast. So you know, I'll, I'll make sure we have the same uh, idea of what the different key notions are: the free energy, collective variables, and then when you combine the two, free energy as a function of collective variables. And the little trick here is actually the free energy profile or landscape of the collective variable is not really not technically a free energy. Or I, I like to to say it's not a free energy. Maybe I'll expand on that. Uh, and then we'll talk about methods to compute the free energy, and then methods to sample the free energy landscape. And how these you know connect together. So um, I'll use as a very small toy example this little pair of molecules here, like um, tetra oh, tetramethyl ammonia, first typo, um, and acetone in vacuum. And that's a tiny system. 
that is actually part of a set of examples that, that uh, we'll be able to run uh, a bit later on. So, so some of the calculations I'll show are the calculations that you can, you can redo on your laptops and you know, exploring by yourself uh, just later this morning and possibly in the afternoon. Um, so what do we start with? Um, really, the use of free energy is to determine the probability of different states. And so the uh, difference in free energy is really the interesting point of view rather than a free energy by itself, right? And it's connected to a probability, a ratio of probabilities by this log relationship. And of course, you know, positive free energy means that, you know, state from A to B means that state B is less probable. And quality of uh, the probabilities means that the difference in free energy is zero. Fair enough. Uh, then these A and B would be macro states. There's something like if you have a binding process, you know, bound or not bound. And there are collections of microstates, which is what we deal with in simulations, which is individual configurations of the system. So characterized by these atom coordinates, you know, X, Y, Z for all of the atoms. So microstates would be, um, so if you run a simulation, what you see is a trajectory, which is a collection of these snapshots. And if you want to compute these probabilities of microstates, you need to sum the probabilities of all the microstates. Or if you do it in a continuous way, it becomes an integral. And so you integrate over some domain, which is the fraction of configuration space that represents state A, prob individual probabilities of each of these, um, each of these microstates. And then, of course, those this, this B of X is a probability distribution of the microstates. And it follows the Boltzmann distribution, which is basically exponential, uh, negative exponential of the potential energy function. So this is our force field here. All right. Uh, sorry, did I see you? That wasn't a oh, no, sorry. That was, that okay, was no problem. Air adjustment. <laughs> sorry. Um, so now collect the variables. What happens when we try to you know, switch from this uh, all coordinates, like Cartesian coordinates of all the atoms, x, y, z, you know, n times, to something to a smaller representation that we understand better? So the collective variables are geometric variables that depend on the position of several atoms, hence the word collective. And actually, collective is not like a binary thing, right? Some variables, like the distance between two atoms is a collective variable, but it's not very collective. And then, you know, something that involves all of the atoms in a system would be extremely collective. So it's interesting to think of collective variables as being more or less collective because the, in practice, like the computational challenges will vary depending on how collective the variables are. <coughs> Essentially, you know, the more collective uh, the variables are, the more difficult um, you know, computations will be. Um, and we'll come back to that later. And so, you know, mathematically, it's just a function of Cartesian coordinates. Uh, so you can write out explicitly one of these functions, which means like this is the atoms one and two. And then, if you have uh, centers of mass of, of two groups of atoms, so G1 and G2, you'll have the distance, and this is just a Center of mass vector for group two, center of mass vector for group one, and you take this uh, Euclidean distance. And this is actually the coordinate that we'll be looking at in this small like toy example, just the distance between the center of mass of these two molecules. Now, you can look at the uh, probability distribution of such a collective variable, uh, which, so mathematically, that would be the marginal distribution. Uh, so we have a high dimension system, and then we, to get the Probability. So we have this uh, high dimensional probability distribution of all the Cartesian coordinates. And if we have this coordinate, so psi of x would be the generic name of the function. So z is the name I give to the collective variable that is equal to psi of x. So probability of a certain value z is the sum over all the values of, you know, sum of p of x over all the values that correspond to a certain value of p. So this is expressed with this uh, you know, derived function. Uh, if this is one, or this is, uh, this will select the values of p of x such that psi of x is equal to z. And integrating over that, this is basically you have this high dimensional you know, probability distribution and you're taking a slice of it that corresponds to an ISO surface where, where the coordinate value is z and you integrate over that slice. Um, so another name uh, people sometimes give this form is a partially integrated partition function, which I think is very interesting. So if you remove this, you know, integrating over the whole space, 
would be a partition function or integrating over a like finite volume slice. Uh, but if you add this little uh, Dirac function, then it's it's not integrated over this last degree of freedom, which is Z itself. Um, so how we how we get this in simulations? Well, the simplest way would be to sample uh, the system and calculate a histogram of this coordinate. And so suppose I run a very very short simulation, well, one in a second, but this system is so tiny. You know, uh, of this little pair of ions in vacuum, <coughs> so it really likes to form this dimer. It has no reason of really of dissociating. So I get a histogram that looks like this, right, in my simulation, and it's because it's a Strong dimer, it never dies with you. So I have this probability here that my histogram is zero over there. Uh, just a big fee. And because the values are kind of, you know, over a very large range of scales, you know, I feel like looking at this in, on the log scale, and on the log scale, I will see very clearly there's this peak, and then of course it drops to zero. And this is not very, uh, you know, satisfying because I, you know, of course we're not really happy that it's probably. We don't think it should be zero. So then if you do some form of enhanced sampling, in practice this is from ABF, but it could be any form of enhanced sampling, I get a histogram that is pretty much, you know, this is the old one, unbiased simulations, enhanced sampling. It looks the same, roughly, but actually it doesn't go to zero all the way. So here I normalize it so that it goes to one here. And then if I look at it on a log scale, you know, this was the unbiased one, and this is the one with enhanced sampling, and what we gain from that is the tail of the distribution, which was just not sampled if we didn't have the bias. Um, and now you might notice that this area here is actually, you know, it's not exactly the same from from both simulations. And actually, my I didn't, you know, uh, this this uh, ABF simulation here was very short. So my guess would be of these two curves, like the dashed one is more accurate. And it would just need a little bit more sampling to, to, to get this perfectly right. But of course, what we gain is, is the tail. So that's the, like the basis. And then once you're looking at this probability distribution on a log scale, it's almost a free energy because the free energy is you know, just the minus the log of dispersion. So you know, there is the free energy profile of this coordinate it looks just like this. Um, and um, and that's it. So, you know, just looking at, at histograms, you're already looking at free energies pretty much. So, how do how would we estimate this from simulations? Uh, so, simplest way would be from this unbiased histogram. So, if once you observe this histogram, this density rho of z, then you get the free energy by you know, taking this Boltzmann inverse, as we call it, minus k k p t times log of it. And there is a constant here, which doesn't really matter because the free energy, you know, only the only thing that's really significant are differences of free energy. So the constant is not very important. But then, uh, if you want to get in the sample of those uh, low low probability regions, then you need to do some form of important sampling. So important sampling really means put a weight on the regions that are undersampled to sample them better, and then you correct that. And so. Um, so then you add this biasing potential that is going to somehow make it easier to, to sample those regions. And then you can still get, so you get this bias for energy here. You can subtract the, the bias uh, that you've added. And there's still a constant here. And then supposing you're doing umbrella sampling, you have not one of these, but many of these local estimates of free energy. And the problem is the constants here are not the same. So the, uh, the mathematical problem after an umbrella sampling simulation will be to find the, va the values of this different instances of the constant so that you can stitch all of these little PMFs together. Sorry, when I say PMF, potential mean force, I'm sure you've heard that yesterday. I'm sure you will hear it tomorrow. Um, and another way is to go through the free energy derivative or gradient. So the, the theory for that is called thermodynamic integration. And it's just writing that you know, the, the free energy profile is an integral from zero to some value z of its derivative plus a constant, and that's you know here I've chosen to anchor it at z equals zero. So so we explicitly get free energy differences when we integrate like this. And then uh, one way to estimate this derivative would be this formula, which I, I'll 
which we'll show up a little bit later. So let's um, let's take the first example of these um, of these uh, ways to enhance sampling. So umbrella sampling will use a number of little like confinement restraints along along the way to confine to distribute the sampling more or less evenly. And so the, which we would call stratify. So like you know chopping the sampling into strata. Uh, and then each of these histograms will give us local information that we have to compute, as I said, because we need to you know, anchor the relative free energy between each of these local states. So you know, the classic method was WAM, the weighted, uh, the weighted, which has an extra H here, another second type of <laughs> histogram analysis method. Um, and then you know, the first, you know, anyone who finds a typo before I do. Uh, win something. <laughs> I don't know why. And then, you know, uh, another common option would be the uh, multi state Bennett's acceptance ratio, M bar. And of course, getting this, uh, connecting these windows together requires some overlap between the sampling edges and windows. All right. So that seems, you know, this has a merit of simplicity, has a merit of being a very, uh, you know, old and well known method. So there is reasons. To be uh, to be careful with that. Uh, most of the time, especially if we're simulating biological systems, we'll have high dimensional. We're looking at high dimensional landscapes, and really, at the very least, you know, uh, if I'm looking at the coordinate in this direction and this is my free energy surface, then there is these two valleys, but between the two valleys there might be bearings, and so this is what you know one might call a multi-channel landscape. So if I want to go from here to there, you know. There's really two ways to go about it. Uh, and this is another degree of freedom, so that would be like an orthogonal degree of freedom. And this bear here would be called a hidden bear. Uh, why is it hidden? Because if you just look at the, you know, at a free energy profile as a function of this coordinate, you will just not see it. So you might be running free energy calculations and you think they're converged, and there is this <coughs> obstacle here that that is just invisible to you. Uh, and then supposing you run an extremely long simulation, you know, your uh, trajectory might walk up one of the valleys and go down the other one. So, you know, for like the ideal case of infinite sampling, this is what you'll do. And eventually, you'll probably not jump across the hidden barrier, but you probably walk around it because that, that is uh, more likely. The problem is if you do something like umbrella sampling, the stratification methods, then you're, you're going to chop this pathway into little, uh, you know, little windows here, little umbrellas, and then your restraint will prevent, you know, this walker will go around, but that walker here will have a much higher obstacle, and so we'll probably get stuck in this valley. So again, like, suppose uh, this is my umbrella sampling simulation. I will get very nice results. They will converge. My uh, error bars will be very small, and the result will be very wrong. So that's a very, uh, which is, so, you know, that's, in that case, umbrella sampling is kind of a misnomer, really. It's more like umbrella not sampling. <laughs> <laughs> so one benefit of using the adaptive methods uh, that I'm going to, uh, you know, not, not so much present as promote to you later is that there is no stratification needed. You can use a little bit, but you don't need to use a tight, uh, tight restraints like this. And so this case should not, should not happen. So one example, uh, which is an old example that you know Chris will like because uh, it's a, it goes back to the, the days when we worked together. Actually, you know a bunch of these authors, I think. Um, so that was an, an ABF simulation of this little molecule glycerol translocating through an uh, aquaporin channel, GLIPF. And what happened in this ABF simulation? So ABF was there to enhance, you know, this the vertical coordinate, there was just one um, one coordinate that was biased, so ABF had the job of making this happen faster, but because there was no stratification, um, the, uh, the glycerol molecule was free to diffuse back and forth, and you see that what happens to it as it diffuses back and forth, it also rotates, and it changes its conformation, and then, you know, it may or may not go through this little constriction here, but 
before it can go through. See, it has to change its shape, and then there is one specific orientation and confirmation that goes through. And if you know, if we'd been pulling on this, this change would never have happened. So that's one really important characteristic of uh, adaptive methods, or at least methods that let your uh, your coordinate diffuse over a fairly broad range of the coordinate. That's why you don't want to, to restrain too much. <clears throat> so adaptive sampling, there are several ways you can do that. Uh, one broad category of method would be adaptive biasing potential methods. So you want a, a biasing potential, so your energy profile here um, is, OK, we, it's just recalling the, what we've seen before. So you want a biasing potential, and you want it to be as close as possible to canceling the free energy. You don't know the free energy, so you, you do a time-dependent bias that somehow the time-dependent bias has your estimate. AT is like the, my estimate of the free energy at time T. So I start with no idea, and then as I accumulate sampling, you know, as I add data, my estimate gets refined. And hopefully, once I have sampled everything, I have an estimate of AT that converges towards A, the real free energy. And then, and then the, uh, at infinite time, you know, the bias distribution, so the distribution of my coordinate under the bias simulation, will have this form. Uh, so E to the minus, you know, the new bias free energy, if you will. So that's the, the, the underlying free energy. And this is my infinite time bias, which is you know, A infinite, which is actually equal to or nearly equal to A. So this is just zero, and I get a uniform distribution. That's, that's the idea, is that something that over a long time will go to uniform distributions. And the uh, classic example of that, or the, the most popular example of adaptive biasing potential methods is metadynamics, uh, where the adaptive bias is the sum of Gaussian functions that are created once in a while at whatever the current position of the coordinate is. So if my coordinate is here in a local basin, you know, I add a little Gaussian bias and it's less like a hill. And so this is pushing the coordinate away from this region I've visited. And as you know, time goes by, I'm adding more of these hills. And eventually, this is the dashed line is the sum of the underlying free energy and of this biasing potential here. So in the end, I fill this, I uh, have filled this. Uh, this uh, local minimum, and then I will push my coordinate out into the next basin, and then I will, you know, slowly fill the second basin, and eventually I'll get something like a flat, effective free energy landscape, so a flat histogram. And then what happens is that um, that the biasing potential is the opposite of the free energy. So my estimate of the, of the free energy is there; it's just like the opposite of my biasing potential. So there's a few caveats with this. Uh, I, I mentioned two things. One is that if you keep adding these little Gaussian potentials with F, you know, at a fixed rate, then this will never actually converge because you'll keep adding, you know, you keep increasing the level eventually. So uh, you know, other versions like variants of metadynamics have introduced this well-tempered variant where actually the um, the height of these uh, hills goes down with time, so you Add less and less, um, add less and less bias over time, and eventually it converges. Uh, the problem is you have to decide how fast you will, you know, stop adding those biases. And if you do it you know, too quickly, then you might it might not be enough to fill the, the minima. And if you do it too rapidly, if you do it too slowly, sorry, well, the convergence will be really slow. Another thing that I think is not as um, a limitation of metadynamics is that see you take to escape this local minimum, you need to fill it. The, the metaphor that the, uh, the metadynamic people use is you take the minima and you, you fill them with a little heap of sand. But then, depending on how deep the, the well is, like the deeper the well, the more sand you need to add. And so the deeper the well, the more time you will spend in there just filling it with sand. But actually, just going back and forth here, adding, you know, adding bias, you're not exploring any new things. So I would say that you know, the time spent filling this if your if your hills are a bit a bit too short and the and the well is deep, you're wasting a lot of simulation time filling this before you move on to the next one. And then same thing, right? All this fluctuation in this basin, um, it's not guaranteed that it's effectively spent. It could be just waiting for the algorithm to catch up with the height of the bearing. So this is where actually instead of instead of doing this, trying to estimate 
uh, the hydro bear it differently could be could be helpful. And that's what happens in an adaptive biasing force method instead of adapting biasing adapt, adaptive biasing potential. So instead of computing adaptive force uh, potential, you compute the force. So you have a time dependent bias force. So the tilde means you know the regular force plus my bias. This is the uh, this is the force that comes from the force field, and uh, and this is you know a prime t is again a instead of having a, a current estimate of free energy, it's my current estimate of free energy gradient. I apply this. I apply this to the Cartesian coordinate. I multiply the gradient of the coordinate. It's not very important. Um, and you know, as with adaptive biasing potential, this converges to a, to a bias to a uniform distribution. Um, but the the time dependent. So all of these methods converge to the same thing. There's many ways to go to a uniform distribution. But what is key is that they don't go there through the same pathway, and so they will not converge as fast. So at some point, what is more important than the long time behavior is the transient behavior. Uh, and that's also more difficult to characterize uh, through maths, or sometimes you just have to do the simulations and see what happens. Uh, so how do we estimate this free energy gradient? So that is, again, the uh, thermodynamic integration framework. So the free energy derivative is also a mean force hence the, you know, the term potential of mean force. And what do we mean by mean force? Uh, it is that, oh, I forgot. Uh, third typo, <coughs> I was faster than you guys again. Um, so what's missing here is actually the some, uh, this is, I, I wrote the average, but not the force in there. So let's get this and go straight to the second line, <laughs> which actually, you know, this term here should be here under the integral. I'll add it for next year. Please come back next year. <laughs> um, so what is so our estimate of the of the free energy gradient is these so these brackets here indicate a an ensemble average, so an average over in practice, you know, an average over the simulation, but only for those frames where uh, the coordinate is equal to a particular value z. So, so for those times when the Given the Cartesian coordinates x, the value of the core of the um, collective variable is z, and and that average uh, here I'm averaging the derivative of the potential, so that would be literally you know minus dv dz is is the force, you know dv dx is the force along coordinate x, so dv dz is the force along coordinate z. It's actually not that simple because how to differentiate with respect to something that's not a Cartesian coordinate. Is not uniquely defined unless you know what unless you know what coordinate transform you do. So essentially, there's a lot of, of geometry going on there. Uh, and then once you have the coordinate transform, uh, yeah, there's a Jacobian matrix, and and this term here is the geometric term that says that your essentially your geometry your coordinate transform does not preserve volume. So if you had like a linear combination of Cartesian coordinates, this would be zero, and your life would be simpler. But of course, interesting coordinates are not linear combinations. So you know, once you do all of this, uh, uh, you can do ABF. So the problem is, because this is a lot of work, uh, there is simpler formalism, which I, I guess uh, you know what? Maybe this is not. Very important. So I will just, unless you're very, so who wants to hear about the second, uh, the second way to compute the French gradient? Raise your hands. Okay, one, two. Okay, there's. Okay, enough that I will not skip it. Sorry about, sorry about the others. Um, so, um, so to make this choice uh, less difficult than choosing a complete coordinate transform between all Cartesian coordinates to another set of coordinates that involves. The collective variables I want plus some other coordinates. Uh, there is this framework proposed by Chikati and, and co-authors, where you can instead of ah, so it's I can it's kind of missing a step actually. Uh, so this derivative so dv dz would be computed what what we know is dv dx so the the force on Cartesian coordinates right that's the Cartesian gradient the high dimension gradient 
And to go from dvdx to dvdz, we'd need to do a chain rule, and so that would be dvdx, so the, the regular atomic forces, times, uh, I mean, scalar dx dz. So that would be the derivative of the Cartesian coordinates with respect to the collective variable, which is kind of a weird thing because it's easy to, to, to differentiate, uh, you know, psi of x and to get the gradient of psi with respect to Cartesian coordinates, but the opposite is not uh, is not trivial. So then, this is actually a vector. If you think of the gradient, sorry, yes, it was oh, just a quick question. Um, is there a preferred method of transformation for taking the starting coordinate variables? So this is actually this is two. Um, this is taking the same variable actually. Given one variable. This is two different ways of calculating the free energy gradient with respect to that variable. Okay, so it's just really it's interesting because they're different. Um, so in the end, what will what it will boil down to is you'll have different terms inside this, but the average will be the same. That's the that's the thing. So what happens is if you think of the gradient uh, of the coordinate, so the derivative of psi with respect to Cartesian coordinates, that means um, you know, if I change one of the Cartesian coordinates, how much will that change uh, the collective variable? Right, that's the derivative of the collective variable. So, conversely, the the what I, I like to call the inverse gradient, so d x d z, if you will, uh, this, that's the vector we need to to get the force, and that means if I change a collective variable a little bit, like how do I propagate that change in the in terms of Cartesian coordinates of the atoms? So suppose I have, say, let's take the distance case. Right? I have my two, my two small molecules. My collective coordinate is the distance between these two small molecules. Now I'm saying, okay, suppose I change the distance by, you know, one angstrom. I increase the distance by one angstrom. How do I propagate that into Cartesian coordinates? Well, that's not. A, there's no unique solution, right? It's kind of natural to do well and say, like, I move each of them back by half an angstrom, and then that works. But I could also have one fixed and move the other one back by one angstrom. It's another legal way, and there's actually an infinite number of ways to do that. And all of them are legal, so you can take any of these conventions, and then they will give you a different way of computing the, the free derivative. The force inside will change, but the average will not change. So there are essentially different ways of projecting the, uh, the, projecting the atomic forces onto the collective coordinate. So that is. What is kind of implicit here, because so making these, if I if I explain what I just said in terms of coordinate transforms, um, imagine if I'm going to internal coordinates. I have my dimer. I have coordinate of atom A, coordinate of atom B, and if I I want to I want a new coordinate system where I have the distance between the two, but then I need to complete that with you know other coordinates. So let's go to internal coordinates. So I have the distance between the two. Well, that's the only internal coordinates, and then I will take external coordinates of my dimer, say I take the center of the two atoms, and then I take the orientation of the dimer. So if I if I do that what's kind of missing here is like dv dz with constant, you know, this is a partial derivative, so it means that the other variables are held constant. And I'm not saying here what are the other variables. So the other variables are whatever other coordinates you're using in your coordinate transform. So now in my in this choice of coordinate transform, I'm going to change the distance, but I'm going to keep the center of the dimer at the same place because that is held constant. That's my partial derivative. So then I will move each back by half an angstrom so that the center remains in place. But if I do another coordinate change, change now, I will say I'll keep atom A as my reference. So my new coordinate system is position of atom A and distance to atom B and then some angles. So you know, position of atom A is my reference. Now when I do a partial derivative, I will keep position of atom A constant, and then I will have to move the other one by one extra. So that's how you know this vector will actually depend on <coughs> choice of coordinate transform. So this is pretty messy. Uh, and and the second approach makes it way simpler because it just says, well, we don't actually care what this whole coordinate transform is. What we care about is this vector uh, dz dx. So it's like along what vector am I projecting my forces to get the force uh, exerted on the collective variable. And that is really the choice. I mean, the, the exact coordinates I'm using is not important. So this vector here, it's renamed. You know, it's like it's called VI. I mean, it's like called V essentially. The I is indexed for each of the coordinates if I have several. And this vector 
has, you know, I can actually pick any vector I want. It just has to be, for my projection to be correct, it just has to follow a few conditions. Uh, one of them is this orthogonality. So mostly, really, if you take i equals j here, the vector uh, scalar, the gradient of the coordinate, has to be 1. So that's the thing, because if you want, essentially, if I'm exerting a force of, of value, a force f onto that coordinate, I want it to be, when I project it back onto the coordinate, let me backtrack. Uh, I'm exerting a certain force f onto the coordinate, then I distribute it onto Cartesian coordinates, so I'm implied by the gradient, and then if I back project it onto the coordinate, I want to find the same value f. This is why this uh, the dot product has to be one. For i, you know, if you have, but then if you have several coordinates, what I want is I want the measurement I'm doing on coordinate i to be orthogonal to the forces I'm applying on coordinate j, essentially. So that's really to separate out what I'm what I'm doing with different collective variables. If I'm doing a multidimensional uh, simulation, I mean, you know, if I have multiple collective variables. So that's just the condition, and that's enough. So any vector I can pick that follows this will work. So this is way, way simpler than designing a complete change of, you know, from Cartesian coordinates to generalized coordinates. So then, you know, the expression we had become something simpler. I'm just taking the dot product of the forces by this vector. So this is really projecting the atomic forces onto the collective variable using this vector. And then I still need to do one kind of annoying calculation, which is the divergence of this vector field. Uh, you know, so this, I have x dot, Bi. So that's going to be second derivatives of something. Well, it doesn't have to. Usually, the vector field will still depend on. Essentially, it's related to the gradient of the coordinate. So somewhere there will be second derivative of my coordinate, but this framework is still simpler. There's other ways to do that. Uh, I mean, yet other estimators than this. Uh, the original ABF had an estimator based on constraint forces, but that was an interesting approach that you're you. Can, uh, I guess average it to estimate the free energy gradient, and then you have a biasing force that depends on T, and you can run something. So the old, old school example uh, is you take this deca alleni helix in vacuum. That's an old example from the Schulten group, really, uh, that, that we kind of hijacked. And so it's, you know, it wants to be alpha helical. You take the end-to-end -end distance, and you try to sample the end-to-end -end distance, and you know, you find this time behavior, so it expands and it kind of goes back and forth between expanded and you know, contracted form. The alpha helix would be somewhere here, and then it gives you this free energy profile uh, with a nice, you know, deep minimum at the alpha helix, and then of course, free energy. The cost for for stretching this helix is very high. This is all, you know, this is all good. Uh, and then if you don't ask too many questions, you, know, you are happy with that. So now what I'm going to, I don't want to go into much detail about the, much more detail about the method itself, but again, my emphasis here is on the collective variables themselves. So now one choice we've made is, well, one of them is what is our collective variable, the end-to-end -end distance, but another one that's pretty important is what are the boundaries of this interval here? And we know we're not looking at what happens below this 12 angstrom separation. And you know, see when you compress this helix, something smaller actually our different runs start disagreeing with one another so it's there's like something you know there's a bad sign here and you probably don't want to look at this no don't look because let's look <laughs> so what happens if you take this boundary and take it back to something much smaller like so you let the two ends of the helix come really close to one another and then suddenly you find all these things happening in your simulations actually those things happen in later simulations but uh, what happens is you have this PMF here. So this was the free energy when our simulation were just stretching the helix, starting from there, stretching, going back, you know, we're good, nothing's happening, everybody's happy. And then suddenly, if you open this Pandora's box here of, of uh, other states, well, so the thing is, if you look at the uh, conformation of this helix, like the helix is pretty, you know, there's only one way to form an alpha helix with 10 alanines. And if you stretch it, there's not that many ways to stretch a polymer, right? The more stretched, the more the less entropy there is. Right? So the stretch forms are very well behaved because there is not much to sample at all. And suddenly, when you let it be smaller, there's a lot of stuff that you need to sample. And those things are have one thing in common: is they're totally not described by the end-to-end -end distance. So you see all these forms; they're just short values of the end-to-end -end distance, but there's no way you will distinguish them 
So what that means is that in this range of values, the end-to-end -end distance is a terrible, terrible collective variable to look at this system. It's just not capturing all the interesting stuff that ha that's happening. As a result, we get like the, the uh, results here are just random, you know, this is, this is meaningless, it's totally. Uh, so what, have, yeah, if you look at the, these are the just probabilities, the histogram from them. So if you, I guess if you let it collapse, then it will be happy to stay collapsed and it will never sample, sample the helix again. So, you know, so much for the helix being the, being the uh, global minimum, right? So what is the global minimum? Is it this one? Is it this one? Well, at this point, we don't know because depending on what we look at, we see different answers. And then you see this mixture of different, um, of different uh, secondary structures. So, so one way to look at it is saying, well, we have this coordinate that's terrible. Let's use different coordinates and see if it's better. So that's what that's what we did. Uh, so instead, instead of using the end-to-end -end distance, we used you know, the RMSDs with respect to different, so essentially distance with respect to some key um, conformations. And it's, it was way better because you know this allowed the simulation to sample many of these. Of course, it's a bit more cumbersome because now you have to deal with 3D data and you have to do a three-dimensional uh, you know fringe landscape. But still, that was pretty informative, although not perfect. So you'll see one thing. These two, for instance, uh, are both stable minima. So if I run you know, unbiased simulation starting from this or that, they will be metastable at least. So I would like them to be represented by local minima in my PMF. And if you look at them, so these are the positions of their you know, like, you know, typical confirmations. And there is no, there is kind of a tiny minimum here, and there's not really a minimum there. And there is a kind of you know, basin spanning like, in between the two. So what that means is really, even in my in my system of three coordinates, these two con confirmations are not resolved. So they're just blend together. And so they would be two grandiose wells, but they appear as just one. So that means that my three coordinates here are just still not good enough. You know, they're much better, but not good enough to describe the whole diversity of this. Uh, so um, actually there are, uh, there are coordinates that would be way better and that I will mention maybe in the second talk later this morning. Uh, so another option uh, that was tried really by Chris. So maybe Chris, you will mention it again, right? As a multiple walker. Maybe. Okay. So <laughs> Chris is not is not promising anything. So I'll just go through it quickly. Uh, it's it's pretty simple actually. The idea is remember when we had these you know two channel system and one coordinate that 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 sees that doesn't see the hidden barrier. So one solution, instead of having more coordinates, is to have still one coordinate, but you have multiple simulations going on at the same time. So hopefully, some of the simulations will walk in the different valleys. So you end up see, seeing several valleys. You have more chances of seeing several valleys if you have several walkers. So that's the idea. You're running several ABF simulations in parallel, and they each you know, proceed independently. What they do is they, they share their, uh, the information they get on the, on the free energy landscape. And then in one variant, you can also select the ones that are sampling in a more interesting way, but that, that's not even necessary. You already improve sampling, just having multiple ABF simulations sharing their data. That's interesting. So if you do these two things are really comparing like an equal amount of sampling, which is very reasonable in a total of 100 nanoseconds. Uh, and so you do that, and if you repeat this experiment uh, several times, you find very different results because, um, so this is just looking at this, so 4 to 16, so the, the alpha helix minimum is here, and this is like the kind of jungle of many states. So these really don't agree with one another because there's too much to sample and they're unable to sample it efficiently. If you do the same thing, but instead of running single at 100 nanosecond, you run in parallel with just uh, 32 copies of the system for a very short time, just three nanoseconds, well, this kind of, you know, this uh, little group of ABF simulations is able to capture this in a very reliable way, at least reproducible. So, yeah. So is it uh, more computationally uh, computationally cheaper to run the multiple multiple walker ABF simulations than just ABF? Well, so in the end, you know, for the same result, you know, this ends up being cheaper. Um, but because like, this is the same total simulation time, but you've you're doing much better on convergence. 
So, and the other thing is uh, running running uh, 32 times 3 nanoseconds, depending on how well your simulation scales, could be actually way cheaper than running once 100 nanoseconds, or when you multiply by, by 10 to get, you know, to get today's numbers, I guess. And that's just, just cool. So yeah, so this is cheaper. The one thing, the one caveat is, um, this is kind of a, um, still a fairly fast relaxing system. So you might need to balance it, you know, you could say that each walker needs a minimum amount of time to have the right relaxation scales. But, you know, still there, I would say that's still very compelling. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think about the, the like AVF having one advantage over multiple walker. I guess it would just be you have to make sure you account for the uh, the right amount of relaxation time for the multiple walkers. Yeah, and I would say maybe there is just the logistics involved. Uh, it's a bit no, it's a bit higher. You have to but yeah, it's really yeah. It's just I'm not quite sure the insets uh, on the reference. Yeah, to, like different. No, yeah, these are the these are the derivatives. These are free derivatives, and these are free energy profiles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so we understand that, but uh, uh, the different colors, different curves, uh, different simulations. Yeah, I think there are four rep Yeah, four instances of the same. Yeah, because the slide that you presented, the 2005 paper. Yes. That was a 500 nanosecond simulation. We couldn't recover. Yeah, that's right. We couldn't recover the free, uh, the the the, the alpha delays. But yeah. then. Then miraculously, uh, it seems like four, uh, three out of four simulations are able to recover the alpha. Delays. Yeah, I think one difference though is that back in 2005, it went all the way to extended. So I think that made it much harder, maybe, um, because it's, 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 it's back and forth to full extended. Maybe so. So it was, it's a slightly easier problem. Now, not very much, I mean, you know, 16 to 32, there is. It's not a very complicated thing to sample, but I think maybe just going back and forth, you know, extending and coming back. You limit the you know the diversity of the confirmations you have at the alpha index. Right. Yep. Um, okay. So so now there's still uh, one thing we've been talking about these protected forces, uh, which is which is okay. This this framework I presented. So the problem is this is still. You know, if you have a really elaborate coordinate, this is still uh, a lot of work, and sometimes it's just uh, it's just intractable. So that with this rule in practice, there's many situations where you just cannot use ABF because you cannot have a good protected force estimate. So uh, one idea that was really not designed towards that, but that ended up doing the job, was this extended system ABF. Uh, which you know, which which is implemented in coal bars, uh, was proposed initially by uh, Tony Deliev, and that's the idea is that you kind of um, escape this geometrical problem by saying, okay, let's not look at this collective variable, let's look at an unphysical, you know, just an abstract degree of freedom, which uh, you know we call lambda, for instance, and and instead of instead of doing ABF on my coordinate of interest, I'm, I'm going to do ABF on lambda, but then I'll make sure that lambda stays very close to my coordinate of interest by adding this harmonic coupling. So it's essentially you know, tying this thing to a little spring and doing ABF on the virtual particle that tracks my actual coordinate. And what's so, and then you, you, this gives you extra tunable parameters because you know, that extra particle has its own dynamics, has its own little uh, noise by integrator, so it has a certain mass, which is a fictitious mass. If you've ever looked at Carfrey Mello molecular dynamics, you've seen that in, in CPMD, you give electrons a fictitious mass, it's kind of the same story here. And then there is this constant K, which is uh, basically gives you the width of the coupling, so you can do like stiff spring or not stiff spring. So, you know, there is ways you need to pick these parameters. So essentially what you do is, so the black, I'm still looking at, you know, uh, stretching this deca Allen helix, but now my dynamics here is as a function of time, the, the coordinates, and the black line is uh, the end-to-end -end distance, and the blue line is this fictitious coordinate that tracks the end-to-end -end distance. So you see what happens, there's fluctuates around the value of the end-to-end -end distance. And here, you see the difference between these two. Um, 
Here I'm around 14, so this is around the Frangi minimum. So what happens is, you know, the distance fluctuates around the alpha helix value, and the fictitious coordinate fluctuates, you know, around it. But here I'm below that value, and below that value, what's happening is that um, there is a there is a Frangi bearing. So the ABF or EABF algorithm is actually applying a biasing force pulling on the coordinate to help it move along the barrier. And because it's pulling, so the ABF is pulling on the blue coordinate, and the blue coordinate is pulling on the black coordinate through the spring force. So there's like it's like a proxy you know, for the ABF bias. This is why suddenly you know the uh, it's not fluctuating around it, but there is a shift between the average value of the uh, of the uh, extended coordinate and the average value of the physical coordinate. All right, and this shift is actually uh, proportional to the biasing force. So this the estimate of the free energy derivative is pretty much the shift between these two curves. So you say here, you know, the two curves overlap, zero free energy derivative. Is these two curves are shifted, so there is a like, negative French derivative. It's pretty easy, right? Uh, and then, of course, if you look at the longer time, you see the same kind of typical ABF behavior. So the two things fluctuate between extended and you know contracted. So you do find this enhanced uh, dynamics. So the problem is, of course, you have to you have to pick this coupling strength of this spring. And if you have a very very loose coupling, then what happens is, uh, so this is just a less done with the tight coupling. Um, tight coupling, this is lambda, so extended coordinate. This is uh, you know, uh, collective variable. If you have a tight coupling, they're mostly equal to each other. So, um, and then you get this frangy profile for the extended coordinate and the frangy profile for the <coughs> coordinate, and they're almost the same. And then you get a sampling that's almost flat. So, so you're good, really. This is basically just like doing ABF, except that you didn't have to do all the complicated geometry calculations. And then if you do like two loose coupling, then suddenly you know, you're not sampling stuff anymore because the two, the bias you're applying here is too different from the actual underlying free energy. So, um, and then if you're, so actually if you're doing this tight coupling, you know this, you get a pretty good estimate of the free energy. And if you uh, wanted more, uh, accurate estimate of the free energy, uh, there is, uh, essentially, if you don't have a stiff spring, then you need uh, different estimators. And there is two available. There's umbrella integration, and there's the XAR estimator, and they're both available in the uh, in MD. And then once you use those estimators, you're doing something that's kind of new, which is you have the adaptive dynamics using some, some free energy estimate, and you're computing your free energy using a different estimate. So that's, you know, I, I would probably call that a hybrid adaptive method. Really, the frangy estimate is separate from the, from the biasing uh, system. So let's, let's have a, a quick look at what these uh, other hybrid methods could be. So sure. Can I just ask a quick question? Yes. Uh, in terms of the free energy that you calculate using EBF, mm -hmm. the standard library EBF, and the regular ABF, mm -hmm. what are the, the Perks of using the ABF setting up over ABF. So, so there's two things. One is you can use it in many situations where where ABF is just not possible. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, under some circumstances, uh, you could get faster convergence using EABF and ABF. Um, just because the perturbation in the actual atoms are actually or? that is no, that is because Mostly because the um, because the extended frangy profile is smoother than the essentially essentially a kind of a noise reduction effect, right? So it's uh, so you get something that's not exactly the right free energy, but you get it really quickly. Okay. So it's okay, actually it's actually a, a bias versus variance a trade off. Okay. It has a little bias but less variance. Thanks. Yeah. So if a tighter spring more closely approximates mm -hmm. the true uh, free energy surface. Is there any reason you want to use a looser spring? Yeah, so there is limits to how tight you can make the spring. Uh, essentially, <coughs> it goes down to these two equations. Um, so the tight spring, so the sigma would be the uh, you know devi standard deviation of your spring length. Uh, and so you can increase, if you're doing to 
decrease sigma, you have to increase the force constant. But when you increase the force constant, then that uh, that decreases the, the you know, oscillation time of your harmonic oscillator, and you want that to be slow enough that your integrator is stable. So you know you have, it has to be at most as tight as a as a um, covalent bond because that's what the MD integrator is designed for, and that's what your MD time step can handle. Uh, and then you can always make this time longer by increasing the fictitious mass. But if you increase the fictitious mass too much, then you'll increase the inertia of your you know, fictitious coordinate. So at some point, you're going to perturb the dynamics and make things slower, relaxing. So that's it, what a trade-off is. And in practice, um, so in practice, you, I mean, what I do is I would set this time constant to be, um, to be, like a bit longer, just a bit longer than the than covalent bonds. You know, a few hundred femtoseconds maybe would be fine. Uh, and then that will impose this ratio of m over k, and then I will set the sigma value to be, you know, somewhere in between. But maybe essentially the what the key point is that the uh, the coupling has to be tight enough that you do get uniform sampling. But it doesn't have to be tight enough that you get the exact free energy. That's the thing. Once you get good sampling, then you can always correct after the fact with these you know, other estimators. And so this little discrepancy between these two is pretty easy to correct for. Right. Are we good? Yes. How do you know? So you should pretty much always do it tight and loosen it up like after like how do you know how tight to run your initial um, well you have I think some of it is like you know domain knowledge you you know the um, you know the intrinsic scales of your coordinate right suppose you had like this I have this dimer I have the you know, association distribution dimers I know that nothing much is going to happen in like you know a tenth of an extra okay. so you know in practice there is kind of a, this reasonable range of scales. Okay. And the other thing that you know you have to do in ABF anyway is uh, because it, it's all grid based, so you have to select, you have to find a bin width. Yeah. So that gives you a relevant scale to begin with. Like you, you've had to make a choice of scale already. Mm -hmm. right. All right. Um, so yeah, in adaptive sampling, you know you need a free energy estimation. And then you use that for enhanced sampling. In hybrid methods, you have one estimator for the bias and another estimator to compute your final free energy value. And what you could do, so we've just seen this example of EABF dynamics where you use one of these uh, other estimators. Or you can also do, like, use just thermodynamic integration estimator when doing unbiased sampling. You can do just random simulation, but compute the projected force along your coordinate, and you'd get, uh, you'd get a, a free energy profile. And then you can do metadynamics for sampling, but if you don't like the estimate from metadynamics, which is kind of slow converging, if you don't get things exactly right, uh, you could do thermodynamic integration at the same time. And then, uh, so maybe Chris, I think you're going to mention another type of hybrid dynamics thing, right? Are you going to mention already, it? Already, yeah. Oh, you already did, okay. And then, okay. And I also, also said that Caesar. Okay. Ah, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Why is it better? Um, because you did it. <laughs> good an answer. No, <laughs> it's a little cheaper computationally because uh, because the dimension of the grids you need for SAR are or I like the fact that you can see, yeah actually time C's are that means the same thing right yeah that means the same thing. Um, yeah you need a higher dimension grid to do that so depending on the dimension. Like if you do a like 3D calculation, you know the grid you need for UI is 60, and that's going to be really cumbersome. Um, and there is also a slight actually there is I would say between the two there is again this uh, bias versus variance uh, trade-off because UI contains the uh, one assumption that something is Gaussian. Okay. And by doing this Gaussian assumption, you add a slight uh, bias. So if you have very loose coupling, that will become wrong. But if you have kind of tight coupling. The assumption will be right, and you will get a lower variance, so you'll get less noisy data. So, you know, I'm not, 
I'm not saying you know my stuff is bad, but I'm, I'm not saying this stuff is bad either. So uh, basically, I would use UI when I want to reduce variance, but I ha it exactly. had to be gone. And, uh, yeah, at the expense, and depending, if you made the choice of kind of tight coupling, then UI should be fine, especially if you're in low dimension, then it should be quick okay. as well. Um, all right, and then, uh, what time? Wait. Okay, good. Um, so now if we take all of these different methods and, and we run them, uh, on our little test case. And then, you know, this is kind of the extreme case because these those are only 100 picosecond simulations. So there are things you can run in like, you know, in a minute on your laptops, which I think I will encourage you to do actually. And then you get all these different results from for this uh, free energy profile. And really, um, so they're mostly, you know, they're going to the same place, but not not again, not the same way. Uh, there is even this, like, okay, the steered MD result. I wrote here that it's a single, single run, non equilibrium work. So it's really not supposed to give us the free energy, right? It's just one estimate of a non equilibrium work. But because of, because the system is so simple, there is no solvent, there is very little, you know, dissipation forces. So even a single run gives us a first estimate. It's slightly overestimated. So the difference between this and the like, consensus is the non-equilibrium work you're doing in this single SMT run. Uh, of course, for real life, uh, for real life calculations where you have a lot of dissipation, like SMD will take a long time to converge to the actual free energy. But you know, depending on what what type of information you want, it could work. And then what's interesting is that you can do this SMD run, so same sampling process. But instead of using the you know, non equilibrium work as an estimator, we do thermodynamic integration on top of SMD. And then you get this dashed green line, which is pretty much in the middle of the consensus of the other methods. So you know, in that case, um, in that case, a hybrid estimator is interesting. Because like, the nice thing with SMD is really guarantees our sampling really this. You know, we leave no freedom to the system. Um, OK, so I'm done with, with this thing. Uh, and then since we have uh, 15, minutes. 15 minutes, so we can talk about this. And then if we have more time, we can move on already to the next topic, uh, which is more practical. So I don't know. Anything? Yes. In this calculation, there is no explicit uh, idea of entropy. So explicit idea of entropy. No, well, I guess it's implicit. It will. Uh, I mean, what calculation are you talking about? Sorry. No, so basically, I mean, the free energy part, sorry, partially is entropy plus enthalpy. Yes. Pretty much here, you're calculating energy. How, how do you account for entropy? So here, uh, which of them are you? Do you mean all of these? In general sense. Yeah, well, they're not actually, uh, we're not, I wouldn't say we're calculating, so let me see. So, okay, let's take one case. Or this is not Gibbs free energy, this is some kind of... Yeah, no, this is, well, this is Helmholtz because we're, yeah. because we're not, we don't have a volume dependence, you know. Uh, but essentially what happens is, if you look at this term, so, you know, all of this is, you know, combined combined to give a free energy derivative, and so we're not separating out uh, enthalpy and entropy, except that actually, not really, but this term is purely entropic. So this term is like the uh, the entropy term due to the fact that your coordinate is not a, uh, a Cartesian coordinate. The best case, again, in the, in the distance example, actually, I think distance example would be here. So you see, um, if you had if you just look at enthalpy, uh, the enthalpy will go to zero. So I should go further out actually, but uh, this term will go to zero as you go to long distances and be flat because of the interactions you know, taper out. Um, and actually, this free energy will not free energy will keep will keep. I'm sorry, the free energy will will have a maximum and then start decreasing. So it would be more interesting. I should make it longer actually. It will decrease and then it will go to minus infinity, right? 
Why is that? Because the distance is interacting much. Right, but well, because it, there is just way more uh, conformational space available at long distances than at short distances. So if there was no interaction at all, what I would have here is a curve that looks like uh, minus log of, of the distance. You know? So a curve that starts from plus infinity and goes to minus infinity, and that's with no that's pure you know, geometric entropy. So, so this is the entropy that is in, in that term here. Okay, so this is an entropy term. And then that term will yield a mixture of enthalpic and entropic terms because it will be essentially the entropy of direct, uh, in the case of this interaction anyway, it will have, yeah, it will have entropic terms due to, um, well, whatever changes in the you know, number of confirmations available as a function of distance. And that is not, not this effect. It's kind of hard to describe qualitatively. One thing you could say is if I just had two atoms, you know, like if I had an iron pair, you no know, sodium chloride in vacuum, then that's good because there's no other degrees of freedom than the distance, essentially. And the others are kind of neutral. So what happens then is I would have explicitly the enthalpy here and the entropy there. That would be the case of sodium chloride. As soon as I have other degrees of freedom, then there is entropy in those like essentially you know, rotations. If I'm if I'm saying I have two rigid bodies then there is some entropy in the some rotational entropy in them. And that rotational entropy will somehow be taken into account by that term. But I'm not, of course, this formalism doesn't let me uh, separate out these two terms, right? Other questions? I think if you're really interested in entropy, you can do Exactly the same that I was mentioning for LTP in temperature. I mean, we have we have worked on that with uh, with and uh, someone Joe, and, uh, except that what we found is you cannot just run your simulation in the condition. You want to combine that with some of the exchanges uh, so that you make it valuable the, uh, the high temperature. <coughs> Low temperature of example, and so and when we have a variant of the exchange for pseudo infinite and so you really swap a lot, and uh, and then you get to different PMS, different and and, and 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 from that you can use DA over DT, and that will be the PMS. So that would allow you to separate this from the other part. Exactly. Yeah. And in this case, in the case of a Frenchy profile, another thing you could do. Like something you could definitely do in this, you know, in this toy system, is uh, compute the average enthalpy as a function of distance. So you could actually explicitly compute the, you know, enthalpy uh, dependency, uh, and we'd be good. You know, that would probably work quite well because that's an easy, that's that's something that's easy, simple. So we could get a good <coughs> enthalpy estimate for this. Uh, if we had an, a real, you know, like biological system with solvents and stuff. Then the average, the convergence of the enthalpy estimate would be way worse. Especially, the enthalpy is, um, you know, we'd have much higher error bars in the enthalpy than on the free energy. So we could get a poor estimate of the, you know, separate estimate of the enthalpy and, and based on that, poorer than the free energy. But yeah, for this system, we could definitely have some some measurement of the, you know, just a you know, total potential energy as a function of, like average potential energy as a function of the distance that would work. Yes, so sir. How much of this method depends on the complexity of the system? Like everything. So if, if you have a large system, pretty much, like if you have one thousand residue yes. protein. Yes. Um, so that's then the thing. None, I mean, none of this board well, problem. Well, so we're always illustrating that uh, with these toy examples. Uh, they're convenient to understand what's going on, uh, but then, so I think some of the notions we I've talked about are the most I would say a few a few things, you know, okay, like you could say forget everything I said today, but not everything actually. There's two things I talked about which I think would stay very relevant. One of them is this, you know, so if you have a bad coordinate, uh, if you're missing, you know, some of the, it's actually the same thing really. So what will happen if you have a more complex system is you will have hidden barriers, 
and you will have cases of this. Um, and then, um, and then you will be looking for solutions to these problems. And solutions will be, you know, finding better coordinates, going to higher dimensions, uh, maybe using multiple walkers, um, maybe I don't know, maybe using even uh, you know extended you know EABF so that. Uh, you smooth out some of the slow convergence. I'm not sure actually that effect we see here. Essentially, the fact that EABF converges faster on these small systems, I think on real life systems, that will not work very much because you need longer time scales anyway. So this is good for smoothing out um, short time fluctuations, but those short time fluctuations are not what are killing you. In the expensive systems are the really slow relaxing to the freedom. And I don't think you know, EABF would probably be marginally different in that respect, probably about the same. So yeah, so in the end, you know, in the end you want the best coordinates you can get, that's the, as your system becomes more. Uh, and then there was one thing, wait, who said that? Didn't Benoit said that? Chris, do you remember? Uh, someone said like the more, the more complicated your system, no wait, the less you know about your system, the less sophisticated methods you want to use, right? And so if you want to apply, so you need to collect some intuition about your system uh, before you go to more advanced techniques and then not think that advanced techniques will teach you the basics of your system. So you need to run, you know, like, I don't know, look at all the data you have to begin with and then run, explain MD in various ways and look at it hard and then go to slightly more sophisticated methods. And if you go all the way to something sophisticated, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. It's like getting your uh, driver's license and, 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 take, and flying a fighter plane, hoping that everything will go well. All right, anything else? Yes. So if I want to estimate the free energies associated with like point mutations and like protein-protein interactions, how do I know whether to use free energy perturbation or thermodynamic perturbation? So, so one thing is uh, those would be on the alchemical side though, right? They would be like chemical perturbation for your system. Okay. So I would not, so if you want to estimate these interaction energies, I would not use these uh, like geometrical okay. coordinates. I think the alchemical pathway okay. is okay. more effective. So okay. that would be what Chris told you about, yeah. I'm sure. Uh, and then as to the estimator, uh, I would say the best estimator uh, would be somewhere along the lines of, you know, overlap sampling things. So, you know, Bennett's, Bennett acceptance ratio is probably, uh, probably the best estimator. Thank you, one. I mean, you can use, so, if you want to nuance what I said, um, sometimes you have the, let's say you have a like protein ligand interaction and you want to estimate the strength of interaction, but you're also interested somehow in the pathway, yes. you know, unbinding or binding pathways, then it makes sense to use, so you want to like look at barriers to entry or something like that, then it makes sense to use these geometry coordinates. But if you're not interested in the pathway, just the binding for energy, then you know, the geometry coordinates are just going to be more expensive. So if I was interested in like a proton pump, uh -huh. I would want to use the geometrical uh, the stuff to see. Pump. So the thing is, the problem with the proton pump is that the proton will, you know, not really. Uh, I would say the problem is describing the proton to begin with, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, Brian would be the person to talk to. I would say because he's into <laughs> protons. Um, <laughs> He's Professor Proton. <laughs> Professor, yeah, <laughs> listen, yeah. Dr. Proton, Professor Proton. Yes. Um, uh, I mean, if you have, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, so I don't know. That's you have the knowledge of that system, so you know what geometry coordinates would be relevant to that. Yeah. You know, off the top of my head, I don't know what geometry coordinates I would use to, to look at this. Okay. Actually, I would uh, slightly disagree with uh, the assessment that uh, geometric perturbation would be more expensive. Okay. So you kind of compare the kind of thing. Okay. If you, uh, if you want to then correctly estimate the strength, estimate the strength, then they're even more expensive. So 
would you say that system dependent? I'm thinking well, of system. Might be, system, yeah. might be system dependent. Yes, but so at least for what we what we study, mm -hmm. we, uh, we found that they basically the same price. Mm -hmm. So uh, did you for 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 for, for absolute binding? Yeah. So there's the question of absolute versus relative so binding. Ranking. Uh, That's right. Relative binding will be like cheaper. Amino acids. So one thing is because I was yeah I'm sure if you have a very superficial site then it might be cheaper to just take it off the geometry group. Yes. If you have a very deep site then you need to rearrange the receptor. Well, in that case, to open. Uh, I wouldn't even try to do geometry configuration. Right. You'll have this tons of hidden barriers. Yeah exactly. So include right. pulling or so again that's yeah things. that's where domain knowledge comes in and so you have to look at what receptor degrees of freedom are involved in binding and binding. And then, if you want to sample those, they're very expensive to sample. The nice thing is, you know, with the uh, control group, you don't have to sample those degrees of freedom. You don't have to open and close the site. Uh, yes? So, I have a question which is more related to the application, so maybe we can continue this later. But, first of all, my question is uh, if I know a lot of my system, for example, in the case of the stretch of decalamine, you start with some initial uh, analysis and then you know that for uh, you want the alpha helix and the extension. Can you apply some uh, restrictions to the, I don't know, the backbone or something to avoid exploring all these conformations and just, uh, is, is that compatible with ABF in the sense of, uh, that's my question. Yes, that's compatible with ABF. I mean, essentially, whenever you apply any kind of restraint, uh, you have to know what you're doing, and then, uh, and then you know, uh, I mean, I'm fine, ABF is fine uh, with uh, you know you applying whatever restraints. Uh, just be careful that different different ways you do ABF will interact with restraints in a different way. So there's this like, little tricky thing. I think we have a lot of uh, caveats somewhere in the documentation uh, because that actually changed at some point in the history of the code for very technical reasons. So essentially, you know, when you do this, you project the tonic forces here, and um, it used to be that extra restraint forces applied with cold bars in MD would not be part of this, and and in the current version of cold bars, of course, in the future, uh, you know, they are part of this. So that's a change. So essentially, that means your measured free energy profile will include or not include restraint forces. I would say that ideally should not be a concern because you'd want your restraint forces to be orthogonal to that coordinate. So ideally, you know that your restraint forces should have no bearing on this. That would be my guess. Otherwise, if you apply restraints that do have a bearing on this, then you have to know exactly. I mean, anyway, you're biasing your profile. So if you describe precisely what system you're simulating, uh, you know, it's just a it's just a, a modeling decision. I would say. All right. Any other question? Yes. 